Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping doing the coming hour we can be an inspiration to you. You in the radio listening audience, if you'll call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up, we'll do our best to be a blessing to them. You'll be doing them a favor and doing us a favor as well. We appreciate it so very much. Now, if you don't have any of our cassette tapes, you can get them. I'll send you a list of about 150 cassette tapes we have available. We have many more, but I'll send you a list of at least 150. I'll send you these tapes. You send them a gift of $3 for each tape, and the gift is used to support this radio ministry. Just call for them by number or by title, and we'll get them right in the mail to you. I'll be glad to send you a brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour. I'm saying this primarily for the benefit of you out in the radio listening audience. Maybe some of you here in the auditorium, especially our, my members, they may say, well, I get tired of hearing my pastor talk about this, but you need to remember there's always people in the radio listening audience, new people, probably listening on Sunday, that maybe don't know about our proposed Holy Land tour for March of next year. It's a wonderful tour, and it's reasonably priced. You may say, Preach Edwards, I'd like to go, but I can't afford it. You'll save your money you spend for Christmas, money you spend on vacation, money you spend for special occasions, birthdays, and, and uh, anniversaries and whatnot. You can go to the Holy Land. And no greater way could you spend your money than to take a trip to the land and walk on the ground where Jesus walked, see where he was crucified, where he was buried, ride a boat on the Sea of Galilee where he walked on the waters, go to the Dead Sea, go to Egypt and see the Sphinx, the pyramids, and the museum, the Nile River, and many other wonderful sights. No greater thing could you do for your pastor. If I'm talking to someone today out in the radio listening audience, your pastor's never been It'd be a wonderful Christmas gift for him, a special occasion gift to send him. Maybe he's been your pastor for many years. You've done nothing real special for him. No greater thing could you do than to send him with us to the Holy Land. Now's the time to get your name on the list and start making plans to go. And I hope some of you will do that. Seven years ago, a good friend of mine, Brother Doc Watkins, he has some children in-laws and grandchildren, a member of this church here, and it's been a real blessing to Northside over the years. Brother Doc said to me one Sunday, he said, to Brother Edwards or Pastor Edwards, would you like to go to the Holy Land? I said, Doc, I don't know. I hadn't talked too much about it. He said, if you'd like to go, he said, I, I believe you, the church would be glad to send you. I said, Doc, if you feel that way about it, I'll go if they want to send me. And he started talking to some of the men in the Sunday school classes and different ones. They said, yes, we'll send our pastor and they got together and made some pledges and sent me to the Holy Land for the first time. The next year they sent my wife. I've been there 11 times and I get thrilled and look forward to going back every time I go. This is a dimension of my ministry. And there may be some of you listening, maybe here in this church, if you're visitor, out the radio listening audience, if you'd get the ball rolling at your church, you could do wonders for your pastor or friend. And then there'll be something you could do for them. They'll always appreciate it. And I guarantee you on the authority of God's word and know by experience, when your pastor gets back home, he'll be a greater preacher and a greater blessing than he was ever before. What a good deed you could do. Now today I'm going to speak on a strange subject. Can't eat a bite, can't sleep at night. The woman I love won't treat me right. That's my subject for today. I'm going to read three different places in the Bible. And this message and the music will be on cassette tape. And it'll be tape number 153. Tape number 153. Can't eat a bite. Can't sleep at night. The woman I love won't treat me right. Now I'm reading, first of all, I'm reading these scriptures from the book of Job. And turn to Job chapter 7, will you please? Job chapter 7 for the first scripture. And I'm reading... Uh, verses 3 and 4. 
Job chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. So I am made to possess months of vanity and wearisome nights appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I rise? The night be gone. I'm full of tossing to and fro under the dawning of the day. Now here Job is telling us he couldn't sleep at night. All night long he would toss and roll in the bed. He couldn't sleep. He was in misery and suffering. Now in Job chapter 2, verses uh, chapter 3 rather, and verse 24, we have these words. For my sign comes before I eat, and my rowings are poured out like the water. Now here Job is talking about when eating time comes, he begins to sigh, and he, he just can't take the food. He's poured out like water, and he just can't eat. So he can't sleep at night, and he can't eat a bite. And in uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Then said his wife unto him, Does I still retain thy integrity and cur curse God and die? But he said unto her, Thou speakest one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? Shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. So here we find his wife didn't treat him right. So Job is a man that couldn't sleep at night and couldn't eat a bite. And his wife didn't treat him right. I want to talk about him here this morning. Because God's people go through severe testing. I don't know any man in the Bible that's gone through a testing like the man Job. Now Job lived back before the law of Moses. Now he never quoted from it. And he lived back before the Ten Commandments came on Mount Sinai. The Lord quoted from the book of Job. If you'll compare Job chapter 39 and verse 30 to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28, you'll find there the Lord quoted from the book of Job. Paul also quoted from the book of Job. He cited in Job chapter 5. It's in James chapter 5. You'll find there that James referred to Job in the last chapter of the book of James. Now the book of Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. It's a great book. It'll help you in time of testing. There's been many of a child of God that's become discouraged. They have suffered uh, calamity. They have suffered uh, heartaches and sickness and death. And they've come to the book of Job to find consolation and comfort. And it's found in the book of Job. Now Job suffered tremendously. He was tested. He was tried. Now God's people will be tested and they will be tried according to the Bible. Every child of God sooner or later is going through some kind of testing, some kind of trial. God will put you through the fire many times and through the testing to make you a better Christian, a better soldier. Yonder in Israel there's a diamond factory and many times I've watched those people working there polishing those diamonds and they have to have diamond dust on the stone in order to polish those diamonds and it takes them a long long period of time to get those diamonds exactly like they want them but after polishing them holding them firm on the grinding stone uh, putting diamond dust there to help cut the stone and smooth it down they eventually get that stone one of the most beautiful diamonds you ever saw fit for a king to wear but all that grinding has to take place and smoothing down in order to get it like they want it. Many times that will happen to God's people. You'll go through grinding, testing, trials, temptation. But it may be God is trying to get you exactly where he wants you. When I was a little boy, I lived on a farm and my daddy would raise corn, cotton, peas and syrup cane and other things. And I always looked forward in the fall of the year, in the early part of the fall, are going to the cane mill. If I got a chance to go to the cane mill, that meant I could get out of cotton patch for a while. And I'd go to the cane mill and we'd grind that chain down. Some you old timers know how that's done. You'd grind it. You'd have a mule or horse hooked to the grinding machine and there you would grind the juice out of that cane. And they would pour that juice in a furnace. And it, and it had many uh, capacities there, little uh, rooms you might call them, spaces where that a uh, juice out of that cane would move from number one to number two, number three, right on down the line. And when it came to the last one, it was ready to be put in the jugs or whatever you placed it in. But all during that time, the man that was cooking the syrup would have a little pan and there he would be dipping out uh, the skims off of that, that cane juice. Uh, many skims had come up on top of that cane juice. He'd dip those skims off. 
And the more they came moved toward the end, they better it looked. The more it looked like syrup. And when he would get down in, all the skims would be dumped off on the backside. And there you'd have the beautiful sorghum or syrup. And well to take home to eat. But the skims had to be removed. Now there's a lot of God's people today. You're going through the meal. And God is moving some skims off of you. And you're not going to be worth anything till God gets them off. Now when God gets rid of those skims, then you'll be meat fit for the master's use, a vessel for the master's use. And it's not going to be easy. You're going through the fire and the skimming is taking place. And God will eventually have those skims off and you're ready for service. But no Christian is worth much as long as he's covered with skims. He's got to go through uh, the process and God will get them off and God will fix you up where you'll be all right for service. And it hurts sometimes when you're grinding like the diamond on the storm. There you, it hurts many times to be ground and, and smoothed up and shaped up for God's use. But uh, God is sending you through the grinding meal. Now the man Job went through that very thing. He got to the place where he couldn't eat a bite. He couldn't sleep at night. His wife wouldn't treat him right. And he was in bad shape. This man was facing tremendous period of testing. The devil didn't like him. And the man Job was the greatest man that ever lived on the earth in that day. There was not a man that walked in shoe leather any greater than the man Job. If you read in chapter 1 and verse 8, you will find there, and I'm not going to take time to read the text. I'll give you different verses. I mean, read in, in this chapter. I did read the text. You'll find that the devil came before God, and, and God made miss the fact that Job was the greatest on the earth. That's why the devil didn't like him. He was a great man. And he was a great man and he went through severe testing. Many times God's people say, well, I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to serve God the best I know how. I'm trying to be a blessing. I attend church. I support God's work financially. I sacrifice time and all these things happen to me. Nothing's ever happened to you like happened to Job or me either. And many times the best on the earth are tried and tested. The very best. The most consecrated. Many times the ones that's going through trials and tests is because God is making them a better Christian to be used to his glory. Now Job feared God. He hated evil. And he loved his family. And according to verse 5, when his family would go out and have a party, when no one's birthday came along, they'd pitch a party. And Job was disturbed about that. When his children came together for this party, Job said, I wonder what my children are doing. Are they doing right? Are they doing anything wrong? And Job said, just in case now that they are doing something she'll not do, I'm going out and make a sacrifice for them. In other words, I'm going to pray for them. And I wonder how many parents today, when you don't know where your children are, what they're doing, you get out on your knees and talk to God about it. That's what you need to do as a Christian. Get out on your knees and tell God all about it. Now the devil came along. He said, now the only reason in the world that Job is serving God is because he can get out of it. Now have you ever heard people say, well, all that preaches out for is the money. Now there's some in the land that's only out for money. You have a lot of these healing racketeers and false prophets and people. All they're concerned about is filling their coffers, what they can get out of it, but not God's true servants. A man that's called of God to preach the gospel is like the apostle Paul. He says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Now a man that's called of God to preach will preach if you have to eat cornbread and drink swamp water. He'll preach the gospel because God called him and he's afraid not to. And he wants to because he loves the Lord and he's going to preach if he didn't get it, doesn't get a penny out of it. A man that stopped preaching because he's not getting any money out of it is not a man of God. He's a hireling. He's only preaching because he can, he's hide what he gets out of it. He, he draws his breath and his sour and that's all he's concerned about. Now you have a lot of hirelings in the land today. A lot of uh, preachers in the ministry today that's not called of God. A man that's called of God, he doesn't let the financial phase of it determine whether he preaches or not. He's going to preach whether he has any money or no. Most of God's people today, people that are called of God to preach, don't have much. They went into the ministry, maybe God called them off the farm, out of the factory, off of the trucks or somewhere out of the office, or somewhere God called them to preach, and many of them had to sacrifice maybe to get a little education, 
and prepare themselves for the ministry. And most of God's men today don't have too much. Now you have some today that's quite well fixed financially. They have a lot of money to come through their hands and spend a lot of money for God. Like some of the TV ministers that's true to God and, and others are radio preachers and whatnot. That's true to God. They have a, a good bit of money, but they just handle it. It comes through their hands and right on to pay their bills for their time and programs and whatnot. And so God's men will preach. They'll preach whether they get anything out of it or not. And so uh, the devil came and, and said the only reason in the world that Job is serving God's what he can get out of it. And, and Job said, I came into this world naked and God give us and God take it away and blessed be the name of God. He said, I serve God if I don't get anything out of it. And that he did. He served God for what God is and what he was in that day. He was God. That's why Job served him. And then we find the righteous are tried. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 34 and verse 19, Many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Many are the affliction of the righteous. Didn't say the backsliders, said the righteous. Many of their afflictions, but God delivers them out of them all. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, scourges every son he receiveth. If we endure chastening, God deedeth you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But what God is saying here is, He's going to guide us and try us and test us and train us and chasten us if we're His child. Every child of God undergoes some kind of testing or trial. Many times disappointments and heartaches. Many times the chasing hand of God falls upon us. Now we need to realize that we shouldn't just say, well, I give up, I'll quit. Because of what I'm having to suffer and the opposition I face, I'll just quit, I'll just give up. Well, that's exactly what the devil wants. Abraham thought he was doing fine when he got them out of Ishmael settled in his home and Sarah and uh, Hagar. And got all that problem straightened out and, and got the fussing stopped in his home between um, Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac. And old man Abraham said, well, I got it all straightened out now. Maybe I can have a little peace in my home. Maybe things will run along smoothly now. Maybe I can have a little rest and I'll be able to get along without a lot of fussing in the home. And about that time, like a clap of thunder out of a, uh, a clear sky, God said, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Lord. Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, the son of promise, and I want you to carry him up on Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him on the altar there like a little lamb. Now, Abraham thought he had all of his problems straightened out. Now, here's the son of promise, and here we find that God told him, said, I want you to take him up there, put him on an altar, and take your knife, and stick it in his heart, and sacrifice him there on that altar. Now you're talking about a testing. You're talking about a trial. Abraham had already gone through the fire. Now here comes this. He thought maybe when he got his home straightened out, well, that's everything's all right now. I'll make it fine. I can't conceive any of the problems. And all of a sudden, the greatest problem of his entire life came. Greatest testing. He said, Lord, if that's what you want, I'll do it. And they took Isaac and a couple of servants, went to the foot of Mount Moriah, Went up on that hill there where the Dome of the Rock is now yonder in Israel. And there he made an altar and he placed his son on the altar. And he said this, what God said do. And he reached and got his knife and he came back to sacrifice his son. And God said, Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand, Abraham. That's a little ram caught in a thicket there. You let Isaac up, take that little ram, put him on the altar and sacrifice him in Isaac's place. Now, what God really wanted to see there was that Abraham was willing to do what he wanted him to do. Man, one time up in years, said, uh, felt like the Lord wanted him to go to the mission field. And he argued with God about it. He said, God, I can't go to the mission field. I have a large family and I'm getting up in years now. And I don't think you want me to go to the mission field. But he couldn't sleep. He couldn't rest. He said, God, I can't go to the mission field. I have uh, children, a family and I'm getting some years on me now and I just don't know the language and I can't go to the mission field. But he couldn't sleep. And then finally he got out on his knees and raised his hands toward God. He said, Lord, I'll go to the mission field. I'll go to the mission field if that's what you want. 
God spoke to his heart and said, Son, I don't want you to go to the mission field. I just want you to be willing to go to the mission field. And when he became willing, then that was all it took. He became willing to go, and God did not send him there. God wanted to be willing to go anywhere. He wanted him to go. And so the righteous are tried many times. The best of Christians, the most consecrated, are tried many times. Job had many trials. He was a rich man. God had made him rich. And he loved the Lord. He honored God. But you know he lost everything he had. He lost his sheep. He lost his oxen. He lost his camels. He lost his asses. He lost his servants. And he had ten precious children and buried all ten of them. That's awfully hard whenever you see a family uh, lose their loved ones. I've been in funerals where I've seen high as four coffins lined up here in front of this platform out of one family. And it's hard whenever you see something like that. But you think about Job lost all ten children. He buried all ten of his children. Left them in the cemetery. And it grieves our heart to lose one. This man lost ten. And his wife broke under the strain. She couldn't take it anymore. And she broke under it. And she went to him and she said, But Job, do you mean to tell me you're going to still maintain your integrity? Are you going to continue to serve God after you've lost everything you have? We've buried our youngest. While she said, Fires you, I just start cussing. I just cuss and die and let God kill me. He said, You talk like a foolish woman to me. He said, God giveth, God taketh away. Blessed be the name of God. And though he slay me, I'm going to serve him. They had his wife that just broke under the strain and turned on him. It's hard enough for him to lose all of his property and then bury his children. But now his wife's turned against him. The poor man. And then in addition to that, he lost his health. He became very ill. He had boils all over his body. He couldn't sit down. He couldn't stand up. He couldn't lay down. He couldn't rest at night. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He was in misery 24 hours around the clock. Boils all over his body. Have you ever had a boil on your body? Just one? You know how painful it is? Job had them from his dandies to his burnings. He had boils all over his body. He couldn't stand up or sit down or lie down. He just absolutely in misery all the time. After losing everything. And then he had three neighbors over the way. They said, let's go over and talk to old man Job. Uh, he's in bad shape. And they came over and sat down there and just gazed at him for uh, several days and didn't even speak. And then when they started talking to him, you know what they said? Well, they said, Job, the reason that you're in that condition, you're just an old hypocrite, that's all. Well, if you'd been living right and doing right, you wouldn't be in that shape. You just, uh, uh, you done something wrong, Job. You're an old hypocrite and, and God is chastising you. Nothing further from the truth. And there his neighbors misjudged him, criticized him, turned up on him. Even his friends criticized him. That poor man is in bad shape. But you know what happened? Job knew something about why he was tested. The Bible tells us in Job chapter 1 verse 22, And all this Job sinned not, not charged God foolishly. If he'd been living in our day, he'd have said Romans 8, 28, still in the Bible, Lord, I believe it. And he did not charge God foolishly. And he said in Job chapter 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, yet I'll trust in him. He said, if God kills me, I'm going to serve him anyhow. And he stood true to God. And in Job chapter 23 and verse 10, But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job said, God is trying me. God is testing me. Job knew God was not chastising him because of some act of disobedience. He knew that. He knew that God was testing him and trying him. I may be speaking to someone today. There's a question mark in your heart as to why you're suffering. Why you're having to face what you face. Why that something's happened to you and you're a Christian. You love God and you can't understand it. And you know you haven't gone out and backslidden on God. And you know you haven't gone out and done things wrong that God might be dealing with you about. You know that. Well, why don't you do what Job did? Just... Uh, make up your mind that your testing is for a purpose and God is going to bring you forth as pure gold. And go ahead and determine by the help and grace of Almighty God that you're going to serve the Lord even though God killed you. You'll serve Him anyway until death. 
Now remember, your trouble may be for testing. Now Job knew his way out. In Job chapter 19, verses 25 and 26, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job said, Down the road yonder is the Savior. Jesus is coming. Down the way is a resurrection. And he said, One of these days, though my body goes to the grave, and worms enter in and destroy this body, goes back to dust. He said, In this body, although that happens to it, in this body, I'm going to see the Lord and stand in the latter day with Him. That's the resurrection. That's a glorification of the body. And Job knew his way out. Simon Peter on occasion said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Why, we don't know who to go to, Lord, other than thee. He knew God was the only one to turn to. Who else can you turn to in this life to really help you when nobody else can? God is the only one can do it. And as a Christian, if you are being tested and tried and misunderstood today and criticized, falsely accused and slandered, just draw a little closer to God. Nestle up a little closer to the Lord. And God will see you through. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't turn your back on God. Like the little sheep yon in the Holy Land. Or come up to tell me one sheep at a time. Sometime during that day. And there that sheep. Uh, that shepherd will tap that sheep on the head. And, and the sheep will go back grazing. After a while. Another little sheep will come up. And that shepherd will pat it on the head. It will go back. And then another. They all want to feel the touch of the shepherd. Now doing a time of testing. God Almighty wants you to just nestle up, draw a little closer, cast all your care upon him because he careth for you. Job got down on his knees. He began to cry to God. He said, Lord, I need your help. And Job chapter 1 verse 22 and all this, Job sinned not and I charged God foolishly. And then Job abhorred himself in Job chapter 42 and verse 6. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job really searched his heart. And then he began to pray for his friends. In Job chapter 42 and verse 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And after Job then determined he would stick it out, and he hoped himself, he repented of every sin he knew that he might even be guilty of. And then he prayed for his friends, and God began to let the sun shine in Job's back door again. It had been mighty dark at Job's house. God began to move back the clouds. And if you read in Job chapter 42, verses 10 through 17, you'll find there that God gave Job twice as much as he ever had before. God healed his body. God laid upon the hearts of his loved ones and friends to come in and give him a wealth. And they gave Job money. And he had more than he had before. And then God gave him ten more children. And the Bible said he had three daughters and seven sons. And he said, those three daughters are the most beautiful daughters in the land. There'd have been a Miss America, a Miss Universe, a Miss World, had they been living in this day and living in the world. They were the most beautiful daughters in the land, all three of them. And then the old man lived long enough to see his children's children, even his grandchildren. And the old man pulled his feet up in the bed and gave up the ghost. In the early years of his life, he followed ten children. Put him in the grave. Now here goes ten precious children. Following their dear old daddy to the graveyard. To see his body put in the ground. The old man stood true to God. And ten of the finest children. Wept as they followed dad's coffin. Out the cemetery and said thank God for daddy. God had been so good to Job. And to his family. With believers it may rain in the morning. It may even thunder at noon. There might come a storm in the afternoon, but ere the sun goes down, she's going to clear up, and you see the sun shining through. Whenever the ship is entering near the shore, the waves get mighty high, but as you come close to the shore, they begin to abate. That old ship sails in smoothly. That's exactly what's going to happen at the end of life's journey. Let's stand our feet. Thank you. You've listened well. Our Father, you laid this message on my heart. Lord God, the reason you laid it on my heart, you knew there'd be someone listening either in this auditorium, out the radio listening audience, that greatly needed this message today. 
And I pray, O oh God, that you'll use it to encourage and strengthen thy people and help us all realize many times we're tested and tried on this earth, but help us to stand true through the testing to the glory of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now in just a moment, Debbie's going to play for us. And as she plays on the organ, listen to me. If you're in this building and you need to come to this altar for a rededication, or come back to God, or to get saved, or to join the church for any reason that God is prompting you to move forward about, you ought to do it while she plays a couple of standards. Would you come? God is speaking, no better time would you ever find. 